Hello, Minnesota. Welcome back to the Tony Hernandez Show. I'm your host, Tony Hernandez. Today's Saturday, May 17th. It's getting warm outside of Minnesota. you got to be loving this weather. Uh, we have a great show today. We're going to have on for the full hour U.S. Senate candidate running for Republican endorsement. His name is Monty Moreno. He's from St. Paul, White Bear Lake here. We're just going to get to know him. He's got some great uh, stories about being from the neighborhood. And we're also going to talk about very important federal issues that are facing our country. As many of you know, there's a lot of problems with uh, the United States right now in terms of the economy. Uh, it's still not getting to where it needs to be. Uh, the national debt is still a huge issue. Uh, inflation, uh, we have some things going on in uh, foreign territories, and uh, it's going to be a great show. So with that, I'm going to bring on our guest, Mr. Monty Moreno. Thank you for uh, coming on the show. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great, to uh, here. great to have you here. And uh, can you just tell us a little bit briefly about your uh, candidacy and uh, what's coming up here with the convention? Well, sure. What part of it do you want to know about? Well, how's the campaign going so far? Well, the campaign is going great. We are picking up delegates. We're moving along. We're getting great, great momentum right now. Uh, the convention's in approximately two weeks. Coming up here. I believe we will walk with the endorsement. And it's not just a walk in the park. I mean, it, it, it's work to get that. Mm -hmm. But it's a matter of building trust and expectation and uh, and coming forward with a, with a positive message. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of people that watch <coughs> our show, they may not necessarily be on the inside in terms of uh, how the political process works. So, you know, just uh, briefly, if you can, you can tell people about... Uh, what is the path to earning an endorsement from a major party for a seat like the U.S. Senate? And you're asking me? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's a lot of work. First thing you do, you, you uh, apply as a candidate. You, you make a decision that you want to run. Now, the reason I chose to run is because I was just sick and tired of sick, being sick and tired of watching what's going on in our country. I love our country too much to sit back and watch it go down the drain with what's happening. We need some momentum. We need something moving forward. And that was the point where, where I was pushed that I made the decision to get into this race. Well, we're going to talk about uh, issues later in the show, and I, I yeah. can't wait to, to talk about that. But uh, I just wanted to take the first part, just so everybody can get to know Monty Moreno, uh, sure. where you came from. You told a pretty interesting story. You actually uh, have a close ties with this building that we're at here at SCC Television Studios in White Bear Lake. Can you tell everyone about that? You bet. Well, right here in this exact facility, in this exact spot, my wife and I, when we were married 31 years ago, actually in four days would be 31 years. And, uh, you know, 31 years is no record, but it's certainly no hobby either. And, uh, but we were married, we were married at St. Mary's of the Lake on the north end of White Bear Lake out here. Nice. Well, we got a little picture of that if uh, Dallas, Dallas wants to put yeah, that on. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so anyway, we got married there and our reception was actually held right here in this, in this building. And uh, so I have some, some warm feelings coming to this, back to this building today after 31 years. So I've only known uh, this building here at SCC as a television studio. So, so back in the day, there was no TV studio here. It was actually uh, like a reception hall there. It, it, was, a, it hall. was a big reception hall. Yeah. Jumpin' Jim, Jim Brazell used to have a gym here initially when the building was first brand new. Then when that, he closed that down, then it opened up and they turned it into a reception hall. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting your beautiful bride here earlier. She's here in the studios and uh, you also brought your mm -hmm. son along, so, so that's yeah. good. Uh, can you tell everyone a little more about, about your family? Two of the sons, yeah. Well, do you want me to start at the beginning where I came sure. from and whatnot? Yeah, yeah. Well, for starters, I, I was born on the west side of St. Paul, down kind of where the Holman Airport is. And uh, I was one of eight children. There was eight kids, mom and dad. And I think we have this picture here right here. Yeah, maybe. And they were going to uh, be tearing all the homes down. None of the homes are there now. And we moved up to the east side. Uh, between the McDonough Housing Projects and the Mount Airy Projects and inarguably the poorest neighborhood in St. Paul. And out of the poorest neighborhood, we are the poorest family. Out of the poorest family, I was like the youngest. I was seven out of eight kids. And uh, so it was eight kids, mom, dad, ten of us living in a two-bedroom, about an 850-square-foot house, one bath, no shower. And our house burned down when I was 10. Hmm. And uh, my parents were divorced when I was 11. And 
raised pretty poor as a kid. And after our house burned, we moved out here to White Bear Lake, just literally about a mile, mile and a half from the studios here. Mm -hmm. And I graduated from White Bear Mariner High School, uh, which is with the South Campus today. And uh, that was 1979 when I graduated. So I have a lot of ties to White Bear Lake. And uh, when I was in high school, uh, because I grew up in the city, and there was a lot of street fighting back then. I, I'm sure you don't have any pictures of that. <laughs> 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 but uh, what we did was uh, I got in a little trouble with, with the White Bear Police Department. No pictures of them either, I don't believe. <laughs> but I, uh, they, uh, I, I asked them, hey, why don't you start a boxing club? And they started the White Bear Lake Boxing Club, which is still being run today. Uh, the gentleman who's running that club is Gary Struss. And, and coincidentally enough, when I grew up in the inner city of St. Paul, our home that burned down, the Strusses lived four doors from us. We lived on the same block, four houses apart from one another. And, uh, and today he's running the club that I started. And uh, so I started boxing in high school. I became a light heavyweight Golden Glove boxing champion, then a heavyweight boxing champion, and then a, uh, a super heavyweight Golden Glove boxing champion. We have uh, a picture of you showing r right now. Is, is that you right there uh, in victory? Yeah, yeah, that's it. And that's Denny Nelson. He was, a, uh, he was the referee in that particular fight. And then we have uh, another picture here. Was this from, from the same night or is Oh, this I, I, that might have been the same night. Uh, it, might be, it might be a different night. I don't know, I had a lot of fights. And is that, that's Denny right there, the? No, that, that was one of the trainers. Okay. Yeah. So, you, so you were part of the foundation of this boxing club then? I was the founder. You were the founder. Yeah, I was Excellent. it. Uh, actually, it was Buzz Harvey. I mean, he was a great guy, a police officer here in, in White Bear Lake. Mm -hmm. And Buzz came to me and said, Monty, you can't be beating people up anymore. And mm -hmm. I said, I, I'm not starting it. I'm only finishing it. You know, mm -hmm. they're starting the fights. I'm just finishing it. And, uh, and so I just said, hey, why don't you start a boxing club? So he gave it some thought, and about a month later, he came back to school, which is Mariner today, or then, and today at South Campus. And uh, he called me out when I was just coming out of lunch, and he said, hey, Monty, come on out here. And his squad car was parked out at the end of the, uh, the walkway. And we walked right out to his police car, and uh, he said, do you remember that conversation we had a month ago? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, come on back here and he walked me to the back trunk of his car I thought oh my gosh he's gonna throw me in the trunk I didn't know <laughs> and he put his key because there was no beepers back then key in the trunk and popped the trunk he said you remember you talking about that boxing club he lifted up the trunk and he said you got your boxing club he said uh, I went back to the station all the guys thought it was a great idea we did a fundraiser he said we raised fifteen hundred dollars we bought all the boxing equipment we have one man who donated a ring we have three professional former professional boxers who are going to train you you got your boxing club and so my first year out i i fought mike pelzer who was the reigning light heavyweight golden glove boxing champion and uh, i knocked mike out in the first round and i became the champion my first year out and so it was uh, all history from there so did, were you uh, what was it about boxing that made you attracted to it was it uh, was it something that you felt as like an outlet to get out some aggression or was it just something that you've always do you want uh, the truth to, i do <laughs> yes <laughs> well the truth is in that conversation buzz harvey and i had he said if you beat anybody else up you're going to totem town and it's a juvenile detention center for delinquents. And I'm like, man, I don't want to go there and start a boxing club. I figured if I could direct my energies mm -hmm. and get me off the street instead of actually street fighting, that was, that was my, uh, my motive. But what really drew me to it after the fact was the discipline. The mm -hmm. disciplines that I learned when I was fighting uh, are disciplines that I carry through with life with me today. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that growing up, uh, you, you said you grew up in, from a very modest background. You said you grew up uh, basically poor and in the neighborhood, the poor neighborhood you were in, your family was the poorest of them all. And, you know, rep Republicans get a bad rap often. You know, people have this image that Republicans are the rich, white guy, you know, corporations and all of that. Um, you, you know, is that stereotype true? from what you've seen and your interactions with the Republican Party? No, not at all. I look at the Republican Party, as you, you see, I've been on both sides of the aisle. When I grew up very, very poor mm -hmm. in the inner city, everybody was Democrat. My first election, I voted Democrat. Everybody mm -hmm. was a Democrat. And you grew up in St. Paul. And I grew up in St. <laughs> Paul. Things don't change. <laughs> and uh, so being there, what I did is, is, is over a period of time, I started forming my own beliefs of what I thought real life is about and uh, based on my life experiences. Mm -hmm. And the Republican Party was family-oriented, it was God-centered, 
it was uh, it was basically I felt like I was home. And is the Republican Party perfect? No, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that. I don't know that anything's perfect. Mm -hmm. But the Republican Party was a great fit for me because the the, the family values, the God-centered values, and America first is were very important to mm -hmm. me. And that was something that the Republican Party uh, was very instrumental in help bringing me mm -hmm. uh, as being a Republican. Can you uh, talk about what it was like uh, growing up poor in St. Paul and White Bear Lake and contrast that to uh, the poverty that we see today uh, under President Obama's economy, we now have a record number of people on food stamps and uh, getting other types of government assistance. Um, was it the same way back then growing up poor? Or was there a different value system that y you notice that's different today? I, I think it's totally different. As a kid growing up in America, I knew that if I worked hard, I could, I could make something of myself. And I knew that the harder I worked, the more I'd be blessed. And it seems like today that the small business owners, which I became a small business owner, uh, small business owners actually have, in this day and age, have become punished. And back then, being a small business owner was my ideal of what I thought would get me out of the hood and, and, and raise me from, from failure to success. But the great thing was you could move from being lower class or poor to, to the middle class and to the upper class if need be, if you wanted to. It was, it was what you could do. But what we're seeing today in this economy, which is absolutely ridiculous, it's backwards and upside down, you have people moving from the upper class to the middle class and people from the middle class to the lower class and people from the upper class to the lower class. I mean, when Barack Hussein Obama and our junior U.S. Senator Al Franken took office five long years ago, there were 25 million people, 25 million families on food stamps. Today it's 50 million. Wow. It's gone up 100%. Now, when you figure there's three people per family, husband, wife, if you will, or you know, mother and two children, you have three people, that's literally 150 million people living off of food stamps. Now there's 300 million people in America, so literally one out of two people, 50% of America, is eating from the from food stamps. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely wrong because the Democrats look at compassion as how many people are on food stamps. Myself as a Republican, I look at as how much compassion is there based on how many people are not on food stamps, meaning you have a robust economy and people are doing well and people have money. And then they take that money and they can they can be a benefit and they can give to charities, and they can give to churches and they can make good in, in their in their own communities without the government micromanaging everything that they're doing in their personal lives. I think one of the one of the things that uh, Senator Franken uh, and many other Democrats, like Congresswoman Betty McCollum and and others, will say that they inherited the the worst financial uh, crisis since the Great Depression, and they're still navigating the troubled waters that have resulted from. Uh, the recession that occurred earlier, 2007, 2008, stemming from the mortgage subprime collapse. Uh, what would you say in answer to that? Has Senator Franken been uh, navigating the, the troubled waters of the worst recession in the history of the U.S.? Look, I don't mean to be mean or ugly, but I have three words for it. That's a lie, plain and simple. The fact of the matter is, our government is purposely shutting down jobs. Our government is purposely stifling our economy. They are not navigating any waters. The waters they're navigating is, are, are to destroy jobs and, as far as I'm concerned, destroy America. And that's the reason I'm running is because I, that's exactly what I see. All you need to do is get the government out of the way to allow the entrepreneurs, the family-owned businesses who, that employ 65% of Americans and allow them to do their work. For instance, let's jump into a couple issues. Let's look at the Keystone XL pipeline. That right there, that would employ 140,000 Americans. Now that's 140,000 families that would be benefited by that. But Al Franken voted no. Not once, not twice, but three times Al Franken voted no to stop the Keystone XL pipeline, to make America more energy independent. Why has he done that? Why has Senator Franken opposed the building of the Keystone? I can't tell you exactly why. I've got my theories. And my hypothesis would be this, is that he is bought and paid for by the environmentalist lobby. The environmentalist lobby is more concerned about the environment than they are about the restoration of jobs and the economy. It's basically the Barack Hussein Obama, 
and people like Al Franken are using the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, as a hammer and sickle. They're using the hammer to destroy jobs, and they're using the sickle to basically to, to harvest the jobs. Actually, the hammer is being used to destroy the businesses. Because we, when you look at what government's doing right now, they're shutting businesses down, Tony, all over America. When you look at, let's look at the Gulf of Mexico for a minute. And this, this is not in a microcosm. This is happening everywhere. The Gulf of Mexico, there was an explosion down there. It was an absolute tragedy, for sure. 11 men died. It went to court. The court said it was an explosion. It was an accident. Go back to work and make America energy independent. What did Barack Hussein Obama and our liberal government do? They stepped in and said, no, you're not going back to work, and took these 44,000 hardworking Americans, tax-paying people, and put them out of work, said, you're not going back to work. So now these 44,000 people or 44,000 families that are now affected now are filing bankruptcy, their homes are in foreclosure, and their lives are destroyed. And you think, oh, that, that, that's only one instant. Is it? Let's look at uh, the coal industry. In 2012, under the same administration, they've shut down more coal-fired power plants than any time in American history. Adding 17,000 to the unemployment in 2012 alone, 2013 it added to it, in 2014, this year, is slated to shut down an additional 250 coal-fired power plants. Now, if you understand what that means, that adds an additional 25,000 to the unemployment line. And now the other people that have already lost their homes and are filing bankruptcy and are being destroyed financially, and now they're on food stamps. And you think, oh, well, okay, so we have coal. So now what's happening is everybody's energy bills are going up. Now let's look, let's take it one step further. We have the dough run smelting plant, if you're familiar with that. Are you familiar with no, it? No, what is that? The smelting plant is a plant where they, where they refine metals. Mm -hmm. And that plant has been around since 1892. I mean, it was just shortly after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And what they do, they produce 11% of the world's lead supply. Barack Hussein Obama, with people like Al Franken and the EPA, came in, changed it, and put that company out of business. They closed down on December 31st, 2013, just four months ago, they were put out of business. Now all these people get to file bankruptcy and now they can't find a job and they're losing their homes and, and these people's lives are being destroyed. Now look at lead. Okay, who uses lead? They, they refine more metals than lead, but 11% of the world's lead supply. Now think about that. People drive cars. How many people drive a car? I think the majority of people in your audience drive a car. I know mm -hmm. I do. I have a tractor. I mean, I, I, you know, we, we have a lot of things we use on our farm, mm -hmm. and everything carries a battery. Well, all of a sudden, America is not producing that. It, what, what bullets are made out of lead? You know, they're shutting that down. And lead is used in so many different instances in America, and right now 11% of it's gone, all the jobs are shut down, and our government is consistently shutting down jobs in America, and they're not allowing new jobs to open. They are, they are purposely putting roadblocks in the way to stop our country from recovering. Hmm. So don't tell me from Barack, from Barack Hussein Obama and Al Franken's perspective that they're navigating the waters. What they're doing is they are shark infesting the waters and make it more difficult for anybody to get from one side to the other. Hmm. Dallas, if we can pop up uh, this, fa this picture of uh, Monty's family. I, I love looking at uh, old pictures like this. Um, this, is, this was taken in St. Paul, is that correct? That was taken before I was born. It was before you were born, and so these are your are these your aunts and uncles in this yes. picture? Yes, the, the the gentleman there uh, with the name Louis mm -hmm. on the right side of the picture that was my grandfather, an immigrant to America. Directly to the right of him is my grandmother, mm -hmm. um, and she was a, a Jewess. Uh, came to America, and many of her family members were killed in the Holocaust, mm -hmm. in uh, by the Nazis. But uh, yeah, and, and they owned, they were, they were small business owners themselves as immigrants to America and owned a little grocery store on the west side. So you're, you, you, you have a, a, a Jewish background then or your family mm -hmm. and they escaped Austria mm -hmm. during World War II to, to, get, to get away from Hitler and the persecution. Actually, they were out before World War II. They got here in the early 1900s, okay. 1911. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, do you hear stories from them about their immigration to America and kind of their hopes and their dreams and their fears about when they were coming here? Well, my, 
again, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. It's, it's, it's nothing to it had nothing to do with me. My grandfather, when he came here, his brother was a viceroy. I mean, basically just a blue blood, really. And uh, he had, in his family, even to this day, owns large portions of land, many vineyards, etc. But my grandfather didn't want to stay there. He wanted to make his own way, and he came to America, the place where streets were paved with gold with the opportunity. My grandfather was looking for an opportunity, and I'm so thankful that I have been raised in America. I'm proud to be raised as an American. And, you know, immigration has been kind of a hot-button issue for both Republicans and Democrats. You see a lot of talk about it in the mainstream media. Yeah. Um, do you believe that uh, there is a need for uh, any type of immigration reform, or do you believe, are you more in the camp that the laws that are in place right now should be enforced? Uh, can you expand on your position on immigration? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Man, you've opened a can of worms with that. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's almost kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't with this particular issue. It's a very difficult mm -hmm. issue, and, and they're playing it, both sides are playing it, like a political football. I look at the illegal immigration that has happened in America, if you want to call them illegal immigrants, mm -hmm. and, or if you want to call them undocumented workers, and they came to America by hook or by crook, any way they could to get here. Today, we have 7% of America is Latinos, 7%. Now these are hard-working people. The, these are people that are family-oriented, they're God-fearing, they, they, they are much more in line with the Republican way of life than they are the Democratic way of life. The Democrats, if you remember a couple of years ago, through God, voted to, to take God out of their platform and out of their party. So we have much, much more in common with them. But the difficulties we face with this, Tony, is this. Our current governor in Minnesota, Mark Dayton, and the democratically controlled Senate and House passed a bill in this last session to allow all illegals who are in Minnesota to be able to get a driver's license. Now, with Mark Ritchie, who has done some things that are basically corrupt in my very humble but extremely accurate opinion, right now the, the House and Senate are doing things to try to cover his butt, CYA. And they're trying to protect him now and, and, and they created this motor voter bill. So anybody that gets a driver's license is automatically in line to vote. So if you understand this, or your viewers understand this, that now anybody who's an illegal can get a driver's license and they're now legally able to vote. So now we have non-American citizens voting in our elections. Now, and, and what are we gonna do to stop and stem the tide of it? Now, my name is Monty Moreno, or they would say Moreno. M-O-R-E-N-O. -E mm -hmm. And when you look at my last name, many of the, you know, the illegals who may be here in America, if they went to vote and they look at Franken versus Moreno, you have about a, the propensity is about 70% they will come to Moreno versus going to Franken. Well, when you look at last time Al Franken won, he won by like 311 votes. Right. He didn't have a, a real majority. Well, this right here, this 7% block can be the key, the secret of Republicans controlling the House, the Senate in Minnesota, the gubernatorial seat, and the U.S. Senate seats in America. Not just in Minnesota, but then all over America. Now, this is a dilemma when you're talking about this because the Republican Party and the Democrats both understand there's a problem here. And... When you look at national politics, I'm running for the U.S. Senate. When you're looking at the U.S. Senate seat and the Senate as a whole, who are the? I, I, I would contend with you the two most prominent Republican U.S. senators are Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz. And you ask why? Because they're Latinos. Because the Republican Party wants to put a Latino face on the front of the Republican Party in order to bring the illegals to the party, which is, we have to do something with it because people like Mark Dayton have now created this quandary that now we have to, to try to clean up. Mm -hmm. And so if it's Rubio and Cruz, why not Rubio, Cruz, and Marino? 
we can have you know, be the three amigos in Washington, mm -hmm. and we can change America, bring it back to what's right. So one one thing to uh, to clarify too, and I'm sure you agree with this, is is if you are a Latino and you are part of that seven percent, there are many many people part of that seven percent who are here legally, who are American citizens, yes. who can vote completely legally and have all the constitutional rights that uh, all other absolutely have. and and they are a hard working group of people i mean the latinos the the mexicans i mean you're talking extremely hard working family oriented god fearing people and we have much more in common with them at, in the republican party than they do for sure in the democratic party who actually wants to take them and turn them into a victim they want to take them, turn them into victims. We want to take them and turn them into entrepreneurs and American citizens. My grandfather, he was the uh, youngest of 13, and his family immigrated from Guanajuato, Mexico, uh, to Texas, and they went to Oklahoma, and they eventually made their way up to here to Minnesota to um, as migrant farming family. I hope they, they came in the summer. <laughs> they, they, yeah, he worked in the summer, and then they went to school in, in the fall, and you know they came here for a better life. They mm -hmm. came here to make money. They came here for economic opportunity. They came here for uh, the educational system. Um, you know, I had uh, four great uncles that fought in World War II uh, with honor, Purple Hearts, and, and other awards. Uh, my grandpa was the youngest of 13, so he, he was the one who, who really benefited from the, the pull-up that America has to offer. He went on to go to college. He went on to get his master's. He worked at Ramsey County in the west side, the neighborhood house, um, did a whole lot, and you know, when I think about immigration and why uh, my uh, family came here uh, in, the, in the past, you know, they came here for those reasons I explained, and uh, there was a very real social mobility where, you know, if you came to this country, uh, you kept your head down, you worked hard, uh, you know, you did good at your job, and, and you did good in school that you could advance yourself. And it seems, and I want to get your opinion on this, it seems that now, in modern America, there is a fear of uh, too many people coming into our, our country because there's, you know, people look at it, there's a limited amount of jobs, there's a limited amount of, of resources and, and whatnot. And, uh, you know, do you think that it would be a good idea to um, allow for more legal immigration, to give a pathway for more people who want to come here and work blue collar jobs and work the jobs in the fields. Uh, there's a lot of shortages of, of employees in certain areas around the country. Or do you think we should have uh, basically the policy that we have right now, which is, is kind of a closed door policy. If you don't have a college degree and if you don't have a, a marketable skill uh, that you can offer an employer, you're going to have a really hard time trying to get into this country which I think is, is one of the reasons why people take the backdoor route. They either come here uh, on some type of a visa and they overstay their visa or they, they come through uh, through the porous border or whatnot. But, you know, that's, that's really what I, what I wanted to know is do you think we need more legal immigration and we need to boost our population of people who are willing to come here and work hard? Or do you think we need more of a, a closed-door policy? Boy, that is a loaded question. There's a lot there. But I'll, I'll try to put a building block together here. Mm -hmm. First off, I am not opposed in any way, shape, or form of having people come to America who want to work. I thank God, God Almighty, that my grandfather was able to come to this country without a college degree and be able to do something here in America. And I have no problem with people who come here who are willing to put forth literally their blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, when I look at my uncles and my father. My father served in World War II. Uh, all, so did all of my uncles. And they all served with honor. Um, I thank God they all came back alive. My dad served in Iwo Jima and Guam. He out in the Pacific. He, wow. Then he fought in the Korean War. Wow. My, my uh, eldest brother, Jeff, he was uh, graduated from high school in 1971 from Washington High School in St. Paul. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was going to be drafted, so he signed up, and Vietnam War era veteran. Uh, I have a daughter uh, that I had when I was young, and she served our country faithfully in the U.S. Uh, Navy, where she met her husband. And uh, her, husband, her husband is a chief in the Navy today, and um, again, serves our country with honor. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I look at that, 
it's just it's a great way to serve your country and be able to give back. But I think from the standpoint of immigration, you're, you're seeing people who are here illegally who can sign up in the military, and if they serve a certain amount of terms and mm -hmm. live through it, mm -hmm. they then can be uh, an American citizen. And, and to have that type of path of citizenship where you would earn it by work, I think is terrific. And I believe, again, that if the government would get out of the way and allow jobs to grow. For instance, let's look at Southern California. I mean, are you familiar with what's going on down there? They're, they're talking about a drought. Mm -hmm. But really what it is, again, it's the EPA standing in the way of jobs. So they're putting tens of thousands of people out of work. We have some of the most fertile land uh, in Southern California, and, and there's water that is diverted there. Mm -hmm. but, but there's a little smelt, a little fish, a little two-inch long minnow <laughs> that apparently is an endangered species. So they shut off all the water to this extremely fertile land. And so now all the trees are dying, all, you know, all the fruit trees, there's no water to irrigate with. And, and, and now all these people are losing their jobs. These farms that have been in people's families for, for two, three, four generations, now are all being lost to bankruptcy they do, because they're not producing the crops to pay for the land. And, and, and of course, then you, it comes right down even to the migrant workers, the people working in the fields. So there are many, many more jobs if our government would just, dang it, get out of the way and allow the American entrepreneur to get to work. It was interesting. I was at the uh, Cinco de Mayo uh, parade, the festival on the west side of St. Paul. Yeah. Was it last week or the week before? Yeah, two weeks ago. Uh, but I, I remember, uh, you know, we had the parade and all the, the politicians were, were walking on the parade. Uh, you know, Congresswoman Betty McCollum came, uh, saw her there. You know, people were shaking her hand. And Attorney General John Choi, you know, people were shaking his hand. And, and then uh, all of a sudden, Senator Al Franken uh, came walking down, and, and he was just walking by himself. <laughs> like, nobody was going out there and, and shaking his hand. And, and I remember watching this and thinking, okay, this guy is, is vulnerable. He's losing his popularity. He was more popular on Saturday Night Live, I think, than he... Yeah. is now as a sitting U.S. Senator, and people don't think his jokes are that funny. Uh, but it, it just reminded me that, that there's this awakening going on uh, with the people out there because we've been promised that the economy is going to get, uh, that it's going to get better and better, and it, it seems to be in a, in a very stagnant and stale situation right now. And people are feeling it in their pocketbooks. People are feeling it in their paychecks, their retirement savings accounts and everything. And and you know, there's this perception out there that the Democrats are there to uh, help the middle class and to help the poor. And, and just when I saw uh, Al Franken walking down this parade, I, I couldn't help but, but thinking that you know, people are starting to wake up to this. But you know, I posted uh, this article on my Twitter page. Dallas, if you can uh, pop it up. It was from Bloomberg uh, Business Week. And uh, the title says that income inequality is higher in Democratic districts than Republican ones. And I thought this was a pretty fascinating story, but it, the folks at Bloomberg Rankings, uh, drawing on U.S. Census data, they measured the level of inequality, uh, the Gini coefficient, in each of the 435 U.S. congressional districts. And it's a pretty fascinating list. Um, but out of the top 35 districts, 32 of them are... Uh, 32 of the districts with the highest inequality uh, are represented by Democrats. And uh, you can see New York is there, Pennsylvania, Illinois, the 7th District, Florida, the 4th District in Connecticut, another New York one, the 11th in Ohio, uh, Michigan, Massachusetts, lots of California there. Uh, but I, I bring this up because you, you hear the Democrats talking about how we need to fight inequality and how we need to have uh, equal pay for equal work. And, and it seems like in the areas where they're dominating, they are failing the poor miserably. And I, I just wanted to, to get your thoughts on this. Why do you think it is, Monty, that they're the highest amounts of income inequality and wealth inequality are in the Democratic districts, yet we're hearing from them that that's their number one issue? Why haven't they been fighting this and promoting this for a while? Well, really what it is, it's socialism. It, it's all derived around socialism. It, it, it is not anywhere to create jobs. Again, they're not in there creating jobs and making people uh, efficient and, and, and self-sufficient. What they're doing is they're creating a dependent class of people that are dependent on government for everything. 
And so, I mean, number one, I didn't think Al Frank was very funny on Saturday Night Live, and I certainly don't find his policies, what he's doing, very humorous either. Sure. I mean, the things he's doing and, and the votes he's taking are destroying America. You know, let's look at the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment, I have my, my, my pocket-held Constitution right here. The Second Amendment says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, period. There's not a question mark there. It's a period. And Al Franken voted to repeal the Second Amendment. Now, remember, when he took office, he put his hand on a Bible and he swore an oath. I take an oath seriously. He put his hand on the Bible and swore an oath and said, I will protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Now, what did he do? He went in, grabbed the Declaration, took the Second Amendment, and tried to rip it out. But the problem is, we had 45 other U.S. Senators vote with them to abolish the Second Amendment. Now, number one, I don't think any of these men are as smart as the Founding Fathers who set this up and gave us this great republic. And America is a republic. Now, you look at that American flag right there, mm -hmm. and you put your hand on your heart, just like your children do, and say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the... Republic. Republic. America is a republic. It is purposely a republic, not a democracy. Uh, many people think it's a democracy. It is not. And, and uh, you, you look at the battle hymn of the Demo republic. The republic yeah. yeah, it's not the battle hymn of the democracy. It's the mm -hmm. battle hymn of the republic. America is a republic, and that's where the people control the government, and the democracy is when the government controls the people. And so what's happening is we have a very... Uh, forward mo motion or momentum to where the Democrats are trying to make everybody think it's a democracy and that everything comes down from Washington on them. And they're taking everything from the top down. But we're seeing in, in internet, uh, you're seeing it in jobs today that are run online. Everything's from the bottom up. It's from the consumer up, not from the top down. And the way the Democrats are running everything is from the top down where they say something, they they hail a decree, and then everybody's supposed to fall in line and do that and it, it, to the destruction of our country and the destruction of our economy. I think one of the reasons why uh, Democrats have been promoting things like raising the minimum wage is, is because uh, salaries and income and family income is a huge issue for many, many people. But, but you see, hold on, no, I, I don't mean to cut you off, mm -hmm. I don't mean to, but... It, that's really not the issue. You see, that that's the they're trying to fight the battle on the backs of the poor people. But I'm telling you, it's a lie. It is an absolute lie. Period. And, and I'll tell you why. I have. Let's go back. You can take a one troy ounce dollar made out of solid gold from in 1912. You could buy four one troy ounce coins. For one hundred dollars, they were twenty dollars each. They were twenty dollar coins. Today, that same coin is about eighteen hundred dollars. Now, if you have a twenty dollar bill from back then and a twenty dollar gold piece, which one do you think is worth more? Want the gold. twenty dollar gold piece. So it, it, it's the exact same thing. You go back to the nineteen sixties when I was a kid, and you get a nineteen sixty four silver quarter. Take a quarter. You can go to the pawn shop and you can get five dollars and twenty five cents out of a twenty five cent piece because of the silver content, because it's backed by something. Today, Barack Hussein Obama is printing, it was $85 billion for many months, now it's $65 billion a mm -hmm. month, and every dollar that our government prints makes the money in your pocket, the people who are watching this, it makes the money in their pocket worth less. So it's inflation, it's actually backhanded form of taxation, because when I was a kid, you could buy three pieces of licorice for one penny. Today, to buy one piece of liquor is like a quarter. Uh, when I was a kid, you buy a loaf of bread for 10 cents. Today, that same loaf of bread is about $4. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing going on, it's actually, they're fighting the battle on the backs of the poor people and say, we need to raise the minimum wage, but I'm absolutely against it, and for this reason, because the Democrats are actually destroying our monetary with their policy, and by doing so, if, if you paid people a 50 cent piece, if you gave them a 50 cent, a 1964 50 cent piece is right now worth about $15. So what would you rather have? Would you rather have a 50 cent piece that's 90% silver, or do you want 10, 10 an hour? The fact of the matter is it's the monetary system, so the battle is being fought 
and waged on the backs of the poor people so they can continue their poor monetary policy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, going back to my original point is if you look at incomes over the last, you know, call it five, six, seven years, uh, what you'll see is, is a pretty steady decline of income. And regardless of the monetary policy, I want to make more money. Uh, you want to make more money. My family needs more money. People's families watching this uh, want to make more money. Uh, so my question for you is, is what policies could you uh, support and vote for in the U.S. Senate that are going to uh, raise people's incomes without raising the minimum wage? How do we make more money? How do we get higher paying jobs created right here in Minnesota? Well, that is a really great question. Let, let, I'm, I'm going to take one step back to come back forward, and it's this. When, when you look at jobs, I have put forth a plan. I told you about it. It's called the 10-10-10 plan. Now, you can see this on my website. It's on montimarino.com. That's M-O-N-T-I-M-O-R-E-N-O, -E montimarino.com. And when you look at what's going on right now, in our economy, let, let, let's go to jobs. Let's just jump to jobs just quickly mm -hmm. for a moment. I'll come right back to this. When you go to jobs, let's look at mining, coal, energy, up in the 8th Congressional District, which is Duluth, Hibbing, that area. The people up there are wanting to open up the polymet mines and create all this mining. But again, the Democrats are the ones standing in the way and saying, no, you can't do it. Now, this, uh, now, let me jump back to my, mm -hmm. and, and, and again, with, with all the other mining, with the Keystone XL pipeline, with coal, energy, I mean, they're shutting down jobs everywhere. So, number one, get government out of the way is the first step. The, the second thing, or the second step is this, that when, when you look at this, this program I developed, which is called a 10-10-10 plan, mm -hmm. now, I had that plan actually, incidentally, before Barack Obama came out with his 10-10 plan. <clears throat> and w what it was, I think he was spying on me through the NSA, <laughs> and he saw the plan I was coming up with, so he thought he'd steal my plan because it was that good. <laughs> so <clears throat> instead of a minimum wage 10-10-10 plan, every sector in the American economy has withdrawn. Exactly what you're saying. Incomes are decreasing. I'm aware of that. So my plan is every segment of our economy has gone backwards. Companies have laid people off. If you still have a job, your wages have gone down. You're not keeping up with inflation. The only sector in our economy that has continued to grow is the government. They have continued to grow and grow and grow, and they're going this way while the rest of the economy is going down. So my first step in the 10-10-10 plan is reduce government spending 10%. Now, this is 10% of every budget of every department in Washington. Now, I'm not talking about proposed increase 10%. I'm talking about previous year actual spending and, and reduce the amount of spending and take that money and start applying it towards the national debt. Now, this so you take this, uh, you take this uh, 10% cut approach across the board, you're including military spending in that and, and welfare spending and entitlement Everything, spending. but initially it'll be military. The only, the, only, the only budget that I see increasing is the military because that's one thing our government's supposed to do. So, but initially 10% across the budget straight across the board. So when you decrease that, the average person doesn't have to work as hard to pay as much taxes. So it gives you more time. You now have more time because you're not having to work as hard to pay your taxes. And then that way, you're able to have more money because you're not having to spend more to Washington. So you can actually let the people who are earning the money keep more money so they're going to have more money and they're going to have more time to be able to spend with their family and go to their kids' soccer games and sporting events and you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the first of my 10-10-10 plan, is actually to put America back on that firm footing, decrease or reduce the amount of spending, and then by taking any money, any surplus that's left over, take that, apply that towards our national debt to decrease the debt so we can actually do some things to try to help the subsequent generations. Again, let's jump to the national debt for a moment. The national debt when Barack Hussein Obama and Al Franken took office was of $10 trillion. And when you look at that, Barack Hussein Obama said that he would cut the debt in half in the first term. Well, now I went to school here in White Bear Lake. Now don't call me the smartest cat on the planet, but I, I understand that half a 10 
where I went to school now was five. But did you know that I was wrong? Half a 10 is really 18, because that's right about where we're at right now with the national debt. He didn't cut it in half. It's gone up 80% since Barack Obama has been president, and Al Franken's been there with him every step of the way, spending money at every segment. There hasn't been a spending bill that's come down the pike that Al Franken has voted against. A lot of the uh, economists that, that I like to read and, and get my information from say that we are not going to have a true economic recovery until real incomes rise and also productivity uh, increases as well. Uh, you know, that relates to the manufacturing sector and whatnot. And well, you need more people pulling the cart and less people riding in it. I mean, when you take 25 million people and put them on food stamps, that creates a drag on the entire economy. You know, if you take 25 million, get them back off food stamps, you put them to work, they've got a job, and now they're paying taxes. Number one, they're going to make more money than do on food stamps. You're going to build their own personal self-worth because they're going to feel better about themselves because they're working and providing. And now they have income to go do things with. I'm all about the American people having more money. And probably one of the things that has changed over the last, uh, let's just call it 40 years, is um, we used to manufacture the goods, whether it was lighters or t-shirts or socks or, or pens or, or, or pencils or clothes hangers. We used to do that all in America. And there used to be a, a pretty strict policy uh, that we would not trade with communist countries that we would only trade with other free market capitalist right. countries such as ourselves. And uh, that's changed. Most of the stuff that we buy, most of the stuff that Americans consume now comes from China, which is a communist country, state controlled. Um, you know, we don't even, we don't have any trade with Cuba because they're a socialist country and some other things that happen. Well, you, see, but you see what's happening here, Tony, is that we are, the national deficit in trade the, the problems we're facing is this, that when we want to take American goods and ship them to foreign lands, they're going to charge us at the rate of about 25% tax on it. But yet when they ship their items here to America, we're only charging like 1.2% tax. Hmm. So again, my, my philosophy on this is very simple. Whatever you charge us to ship our products yeah. to you is what we're going to charge you with your products coming in here. If we're buying more of their products, they're going to pay the 25% tariff that they're charging us to send our products there, whether it's China, Japan, Korea. I don't care who it is. We're going to, we're going to level the playing field it, here. You know, that's a, that's a great point that you make there, Monty. And, and my question is, why, Thank you very much. Why, would we, why are our politicians and our elected officials, why are they so eager to tax either Minnesotans or Americans or taxing the rich or taxing corporations, American businesses? Why are they so eager to, to tax and regulate American entities and so hesitant to uh, put those taxes on uh, imports like, like you explained? Because, because they, they, none of them have been business owners. I've been a small business owner. When you're a small business owner, boy, I tell you, you know, you get taxed to oblivion. It is very difficult. I mean, the government makes it so difficult for a small business to make money today. 65% of people in America are, are, are put to work in a small business. It used to be 80%, but our government is squashing small business and putting small business out of business, therefore decreasing the amount of jobs. What we have to do is we need to create a culture and environment that encourages job creation, that encourages people, and gives them benefits to go out and do something to put other people to work too. And it, it creates a better America. But, but the problem is what you have in Washington, including with Al Franken, he's never owned a small business. I've been a small business owner. I know what it's like to be the first one in and the last one to leave. And, you know, you've got to pay all the expenses. You pay federal unemployment, state unemployment, workman's comp, professional liability, you match Social payroll Security. Taxes. I mean, the payroll taxes. The, I mean, it's just the expenses a small business is Enormous. burdened with by government regulation is destroying small business in America. So if you want to get people back to work, you need to be able to promote small business and get government out of the way and get government off of their back. I mean, when the average, I heard a gentleman speaking on the radio and he opened up his own auto mechanics store, a, a store ran his own because he loved working on cars. But actually what he did since he's had his business in 10 years from what he's earned, his own personal income, what he was able to keep 
was about 40000 a year, but what he paid in taxes was 80000 a year. He paid $80,000 a year in taxes, and he himself was taking home to provide for his family 40000 a year. This is ridiculous, because this man didn't go into business to work for the government or bring on a government partner. He went into business to put people to work. He has a bunch of employees. But man, this guy can't raise people's wages because there's not enough money. He's taking what's left over. He has employees that are making more money than him. And this is commonplace in America because the people running our government don't have a small business mindset, or if you call it a small business degree, from the standpoint of owning, running, operating a business, if you knew the roadblocks that the government puts in your way, you would have a much better footing and understanding of how to make America work, and that's what I've got, and that's what I can bring to the table. Another change that uh, has been observed by others over the last, uh, let's just say, 10, 20 years is our relationship with Israel. Mm -hmm. um, you see a lot more uh, than you used to politicians who uh, either bash Israel or ignore Israel. Uh, is Israel in danger right now from its enemies? Israel is in, a, is in a very precarious situation. When you look at this U.S. Senate race, so let's look at this seat specifically for just a, a moment. Mm -hmm. Eighteen years ago, Tony, I ran for this same seat. And I was a small business owner. I felt I was really more independent. But what I did is I looked at the entire U.S. Congress and the U.S. Senate. And what I found was that you have 535 members. Now, of 535 members, when I first ran, there was one independent. The rest of them had an R for Republican mm -hmm. or a D behind their name. There was no independent, so I couldn't run as an independent, so I ran as an R, as a Republican, mm -hmm. because the man sitting in the seat was a Democrat. So I was the eighth Republican got in for that seat, and I went from eighth place to sixth place to fifth place to fourth place to third place, because I had a message like this, a straight-up message. I wasn't beating around the bush and playing politics. And then I eventually moved into second place. I passed Rudy Boschwitz, a former two-term U.S. senator, even though... And we went to the Minnesota State Convention, and there was no endorsement for the first time in Minnesota's history, even though I was outspent by over six and a half million dollars. You say, well, Monty, you didn't get the nomination, but hey, neither did they. And, they. and these two gentlemen had a lot more name recognition and spent a lot more money than I did, and they didn't get it either. So, to get back to your question, so today I'm running. So, the, uh, want to reiterate the question? Yeah, it was just about Israel. Is uh, yeah. you know people? There's okay. been a lot of talk. There's a lot of uh, yeah. I, I get the point. So, uh, so the 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 reason I told you that was to tell you this, is that Rudy Boschwitz was a Jew, and then the man who beat him, Paul David Wellstone, was a Jew. He the, he had two terms. He had two mm -hmm. terms, and then Coleman wanted. He was a Jew, and then the and now Franken has it, and he's a Jew. This seat has been held by somebody with Jewish blood or Hebrew blood for approximately 40 years. Wow. And all the Republican candidates, I'm the only one with Hebrew blood who's running for this seat. I believe if somebody's going to win this as a Republican, it's going to be me. But now Israel. Let's look at Israel for just a moment. Israel's in a terrible place. I have been watching and studying Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, and he's in a very precarious situation, not much different than what we find ourselves here in America. But he's damned if he do, and he's damned if he don't. And, and what I mean by that is this, out of his own words, he said, Iran is there poking and thumbing Israel in the eye and saying, we're going to destroy you, we're going to drive you in the ocean, we don't believe the Holocaust ever happened. I have family pictures of Holocaust victims, mm. okay? The Holocaust happened. And, 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 but they want to drive Israel into the ocean. Now, the top Iranian cleric in January of this year said, we need a nuclear bomb to destroy Israel. Now, think about that. If, you, if you're going to destroy, or actually the, the real term he used was to put Israel down. If you're going to put down a dog, what do you do? You destroy it. So they want a nuclear bomb to destroy Israel. So you understand that Benjamin Netanyahu says, if we attack these people preemptively to stop them so they don't get a nuclear weapon, we're condemned by the entire world. But if we don't go in and attack... We, are, we condemn ourselves by being attacked and destroyed with a nuclear bomb. Now let's look at what America did. America is complicit. The Bible says, I will bless those who bless thee and I will curse those who curse thee. It was a promise given by God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. And to Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. And he said this, is a, this will last a thousand generations. That's a promise that still stands in play. But what happened was Barack Obama 
basically released 20 billion, with a B, 20 billion dollars to the Iranians, and then, believe it or not, gave them the technology to spin faster centrifuges and create a nuclear bomb faster. So now the problem is, if Israel attacks Iran to stop them from getting the nuclear bomb, and even by American standards, they're saying Israel can't attack any later than October of this year, and, and Iran's going to have a nuclear bomb. So if there's a preemptive strike, the whole world's going to turn against Israel. And then the difficulty you're facing is this. If they attack, the Straits of Hormuz, where 50% of the entire world's oil supply flows through, mm -hmm. is controlled by Iran. So you go ahead and Israel bombs Iran, and all of a sudden, you will see fuel prices here in America rise in a way you've never seen before. And I believe we'll go from this three fifty, four dollars dollars a gallon range to about $8 a gallon, in my estimation, within a month. It will change the way our food is delivered to us because everything comes via big trucks. And so truck drivers and stuff out there, they can't do anything about it. It's just an increase in cost. You'll see food prices probably quadruple in a very short order. The average person won't be able to afford the food or the oil to even drive their car. I mean, this is a very serious consequence of America not taking action to set the table properly. Mm -hmm. And why do you think uh, people have been hesitant to support Israel? That's a good question. When you look at Barack Obama, he has filled his entire cabinet with anti-Semites, people who hate Israel. I think at this point he has between 10 and 15 Muslim Brotherhood members in his cabinet. These are people who are sworn enemies of Israel. Look at, look at our ambassador to the United Nations. Her name's Samantha Power. You can see her on my website. Go to montemarino.com, go under Newsfeed, and under Newsfeed you'll find Samantha Power. Samantha Power is not only an anti-Semite, but on there I have a video, where, about a two-minute video, where she's saying that America should attack Israel. These people are rabid. They don't like Israel. And so when I look at what Washington is doing, they're setting the table for disaster. Well, Dallas, if we can uh, pop up Monty's website here, uh, everybody can go to it. It's M-O-N-T-I-M-O-R-E-N-O dot com. It looks like a, a great website, and we encourage all the viewers out there to uh, visit this website to learn more about Monty, to learn more about his candidacy, and uh, more about the issues that he stands for. It looks like there's a ton of uh, great information on here. And um, so, Monty, the question is, the endorsement is coming up on May 31st. Uh, some of the candidates have said that they're going to honor the endorsement. Others said that they're not. Um, if you're not endorsed on May 31st, are you going to uh, continue and run in the primary? I'm not planning on it, no. There, there's, um, you know, I have a life. I have, I have a beautiful wife. You've met Nance. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, and I, I'm I, sorry, I, but I, that was your other son. I, I just met the first one coming yeah. in. I didn't see we have the three second sons one. And, so. and, well, anyway, uh, and two daughters. Mm -hmm. But um, when I look at uh, what's going on at the endorsement, the, the endorsement's actually on Friday the 30th. Friday the 30th is the endorsement for the U.S. Senate. And I do hope and pray that we are able to get that endorsement. In doing so, we will bring approximately $20 million into this race with the endorsement. And I have uh, men that I'm meeting with that, that have a lot of money and a lot of clout in America. This is money that has never been in Minnesota before. And this is one way to straighten America out. I mean, this is the first step to be able to get Minnesota moving again in the right direction. Putting people to work, putting more money in their pocket, getting the, the bureaucracy or government off their back, and allowing the families to have more time. In the, you know, some people have said that they're could be a situation where there is no endorsement of a U.S. Senate candidate. I saw that 18 years ago. <laughs> so if there's no endorsement, are you going to run in the primary? I'll run in the primary if there's no endorsement. Sounds good. Well, if you could just let everybody know, we only have about uh, 20 seconds left here, how they can get a hold of you. Again, that website is monimoreno.com. Uh, do you have any yep. uh, big events coming up? or? Uh, primarily, we're just going out to speaking engagements everywhere we have them lined up at. Uh, if you want to contact us, you can contact us right on the website, or you can go to Monte Marino, and then the number four, the numeral four, U.S. Senate. 
at gmail.com. So Manny, Manny for USN at gmail.com. Sounds great. Well, Manny, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. Well, thank and, you so uh, much. I wish you the best of luck the next couple of weeks here. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, hope I can count on your vote. We'll see you in the future. Thanks. God bless you and God bless America. And that was Monty Moreno, U.S. Senate candidate. Again, his website is MontyMoreno.com. We encourage you all to go there. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. I want to thank SCC Television Studios, SPNN. Thanks our beauty audience. You can always watch our reruns online. Our YouTube channel is Tony Hernandez Show. May God bless you. May God bless America. And vaya con Dios.